morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. And thanks to Creative Mornings and to 21C for having me. Uh, I feel like she just took away the first two minutes that I had to say by reading my bio out loud. But <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I am an artist and illustrator. I was born in Lexington and grew up in Nicholasville. I grew up on a tobacco farm. Um, and, you know, kind of growing up being isolated on a farm, I sought out stuff that was a little outside of the range of what was available to me uh, in Nicholasville. And, you know, I, I got pretty into animation and comics and all of this stuff. And for me, that was kind of like a gateway to, to a world outside of what I knew. Um, and like most teenagers, I got into music. Um, and pretty quickly from standard, like MTV stuff, went, went out to the furthest reaches of what was available to me at the time, getting into free jazz and experimental music and stuff. And I was always drawn to stuff through the artwork. Um, so I started getting into things like Frank Zappa and you know his album covers done by Cal Schenkel, who was doing a lot of his other, a lot of his early records and jazz fusion records by Miles Davis with covers by Maddie Clarewine, who's a really amazing psychedelic artist. And so, this was always something that I, I was drawn to and kind of thought that you know I would like to make album covers, but I didn't know how to do that. So I started playing music with some friends when I was in high school, um, but I'm not really a musician. <laughs> so the stuff that we were doing was often super improvisational and just kind of, you know, not, not really planning or knowing what we were gonna do before. And um, another big part of what kind of led me down this path is I grew up on the south side or on the north side of Jessamine County, which is close to Lexington, but not really there. And I was able to get WRFL, which is the college radio station at the University of Kentucky. And so, you know, at the time, this was like in the mid late nineties and you could hear insane Japanese noise music at 2 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon. And that kind of blew my mind wide open and you know, exposed me to things that I, you know, were not available to me in a small town. Um, and as soon as I finished high school, I started volunteering at WRFL, and that is a huge part of why I'm here speaking with you today. Because I met so many like-minded people and met the people that I started the band Hair Police with, which was. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to have slides. <laughs> this is some of the album covers I've done. Uh, and so I started doing a lot of graphic design for WRFL. And this is kind of where I cut my teeth, learning how to actually make, um, you know, how to make a poster and, you know, work in a way that kind of represented music. Um, that was being the shows that were being put on by the radio station. Um, and so through this, I kind of, you know, had a lot of time to kind of develop stylistically and also just it's, you know, was pretty low pressure. A lot of times these were flyers for shows that, you know, maybe 10 people would be at. So, uh, and so at the radio station as well, I met a lot of like-minded people and started playing music with a lot of them. And that's the band Hair Please. Um, uh, so obviously, 
straight from that to doing an album cover for Kesha. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously what we're doing is pretty out there. A lot of people didn't even consider it music, but you know, for what we were doing, we got a decent amount of success, toured in the US and Europe and all over the place and ended up you know, going on tour with Sonic Youth, opening up for them in 2004. But one of the things that this is, it's a really important thing for me because we were releasing a lot of records. Um, and I, you know, we all kind of did the artwork together collaboratively, but um, I ended up doing all of the kind of grunt work of, you know, putting things in templates and laying things out so this was kind of how I started doing album covers was for music that I was directly involved with. Um, and a lot of the artwork, obviously this is, you know, a selection of a few of our album covers. It was really kind of intentionally crude and a lot of it was photocopied and just thrown together in a few minutes, you know, it wasn't really like, we would kind of just do stuff because we were putting out a lot of records, you know, in the span of like, you know, five or six years, we released probably like 20, 20 albums or something. And, and, you know, we're doing a lot of cassettes and CDR releases as well. So, um, yeah, this is kind of where, you know, where I got started doing album art. And the thing that developed from this was um, meeting a lot of people who were doing similar music or, you know, just touring and meeting other people in bands. and. Eventually, some other people um, started asking me to do artwork for their records. Um, and this is one of the first album covers that I did for a project that I was only tangentially involved with. This is for a band called Burning Star Core, which was based out of Cincinnati at the time and that I sometimes played with, but this record is not something I'm on. Um, and this is kind of the first that I developed the style that I've kind of, you know, grown with over the years, this uh, like emulating airbrush art, um, which, um, you know, my early exposure to that was the animation on Monty Python. <laughs> and I got, you know, all of Terry Gilliam's animation on Monty Python was like huge for me when I was a kid, just because I, it, you know, was super weird and not like anything else really that you could see on like, I think they showed Monty Python on PBS. So it was, you know, once again, something that was like available to me in a small town in Kentucky. Um, yeah, and so this cover was kind of what started stuff for me. And then, um, you know, through the community of like underground experimental music, I met a lot of other people who went on to do you know, maybe when I knew them weren't necessarily doing the mm -hmm. bands that they, you know, went on to do, but I met a lot of people through playing shows all over the world for years that went on to kind of do something a little more accessible um, outside of the underground. So uh, Peaking Lights is a band that, you know, they had a lot of more experimental projects and members from real estate and one of Tricks Point Never, who is one of the people who I've kind of developed a long running relationship with. Um, one of Tricks Point Never is a project f by a musician named Daniel LaPatton. And his music is a really strange blend of kind of ambient collage electronic stuff. And so it's been really nice to work with him because he's he's pretty open to experimentation which is you know that's the way that i work is pretty loose and kind of improvisational um so these are some of the covers i've done for him and his music is often like kind of distant <laughs> i guess is a good word for it but it's also kind of like fragile so it seems like it could turn a corner, fall apart at any moment. So that's, you know, some of the stuff that I'm trying to represent with the covers that I've done for him or um, this kind of, it's like a stillness that could kind of break apart at any moment. Um, 
Yeah. Um, like I said, the, the way that I make art is, you know, very improvisational. And a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is, you know, I have a lot of themes in my work that pop up over and over. I, my default mode is kind of orbs and goo, <laughs> which you'll see a lot um, in what I'm doing. But I also kind of have this obsession with portals and gateways and, you know, things breaking open and turning into other things like transforming. And I, I think that's a big, you know, that kind of symbolism in what I'm doing is, you know, kind of comes from the way that I discovered a lot of the art and music that I'm really into is, you know, it's like everything that I would find out about when I was a kid was always just a beginning for something. It was like opening a door and then there's another door behind that and another door and another door, you know, it's, there's always a thread that you can follow from one thing to another. And that's the way, you know, that I've managed to end up where I am today is just through following all these different threads. And so I, I feel like that's kind of subconsciously come, come through in a lot of my work, this kind of transformation and, um, you know, passageway. So a lot of the work that I do is, you know, it looks a lot like painting, um, but the way that I work is way more related to collage than it is painting. So I'm, I'm often kind of just making a lot of stuff all at once and sorting through it and figuring out what I'm going to do with it. Um, so I, I always have, you know, every project that I work on, there's always, you know, leftovers that I feel like can be turned into their own thing. And so I, you know, often will rework stuff that I've done in the past and turn it into something new. And this, this project, which is here, which is a book called Floodgate Companion, was kind of, a, you know, I worked on this project for probably five or six years, and it was a lot of stuff that maybe it was part of an album cover at one point and got cut, and then, you know, I kind of developed it a little bit further. Um, but this book is a non-narrative, um, not necessarily a collection of artwork because it was all artwork made specifically for this project, but it's, it's kind of almost, I, I kind of envisioned a science fiction book that doesn't have a story, but it's just ephemera from a world that you can't access other than this ephemera that's presented to you. So there's a lot of, you know, There's a lot of stuff that's pretty opaque and doesn't really give you a lot to go on. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, a lot of the work that I do, I, I like finding out what other people think it is. I don't, I don't like to tell people what something I do means. Um, I would rather find out what someone else thinks it is and then kind of learn from that. Um, and that's, that's the way, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is not really conscious. It's kind of automatic, like the stuff just kind of comes out when I sit down at a piece of paper or whatever. So a lot of it for me is like figuring out, you know, when I make things, it's a lot of editing and kind of arranging things where they make sense in a certain way. Um, this book was also heavily inspired by, um, I collect old graphic design annuals, which are often presented, you know, a selection of stills from a commercial or from an experimental film or like posters for movies that you will never be able to see. So this idea of having this image that's kind of taken out of context that you know, it's a still from a film that you'll never, that doesn't exist anymore or isn't accessible to watch on the internet. And that's kind of just that idea of having an image and that's all you know of something. And you, you can kind of make up the rest of 
the story yourself, you know, if you if you see an image and you know it's a still from a film, but you can't see that film, like you your mind kind of figures out, you know, what you think that film might be like. So that's that's a big part of it. And there's also there's a book by the Polish science fiction author Stanislav Lem, who his best known book is Solaris, but he has a book called The Perfect Vacuum that instead of writing a bunch of novels, he wrote reviews of novels, science fiction novels that don't exist. <laughs> and just that idea, when I first found out about that was so crazy to me that he you know, could have written all these books, but instead just wrote reviews as if he were a critic critiquing these books that he didn't write. And so that was a big inspiration for this, kind of like creating these worlds that could have been there, you know, every page in this book could have been its own book you know i could have taken that world and expanded on it but i like the idea of it being this like limited view of something uh and something that does not have a limited view is this cover that i did for tame impala for their album currents which is still probably the thing that i'm best known for and was kind of the album cover that pushed things over the edge for me and take took things to a new level just because they were already a popular band, but kind of became way more popular when this album came out. Um, and this was, I still think this is one of the most effective album covers that I've done because it's so simple, but it gets across the themes of the record very well, which is, you know, album covers are strange because I'm doing artwork that is my artwork, but it isn't really a part of my thing. It's always for someone else. So, you know, you're kind of giving yourself over to this other thing, being a band, um, and trying to represent what they're doing. So, and it doesn't always work. <laughs> There's definitely a decent amount of album covers that were a struggle to make it. Um, but yeah, this was, this is definitely one of the most effective ones. And I have a joke that any good album cover is just a variation on either Dark Side of the Moon or Joy Division's <laughs> uh, Unknown Pleasures. And after I made this one, I realized that it's basically just a combo of the two. <laughs> so, you know, it works. Uh, one of the strangest things that has happened uh, in the past few years, like as things have kind of developed for me is one of my favorite bands when I was a teenager, The Flaming Lips, I ended up doing an album cover for them a couple years ago. And this came about in a really strange way. So I posted this, this is a, on the left here is this page from Floodgate Companion. And this in the middle is a sketch that I posted kind of showing a little bit of my process and I posted it on Instagram and Wayne Coyne saw it and commented with all these emojis and then, <laughs> and then asked me in the <laughs> comments of Instagram if he could use it as an album cover. And I was, at first I was like, no, this isn't done. <laughs> uh, but obviously he convinced me because there's the final album cover there on the right. Um, and so as a direct result of doing a cover for The Flaming Lips, I ended up doing the cover for Kesha's album, Rainbow. Um, she had collaborated with The Flaming Lips. And so this was a really, you know, a interesting thing for me because she's by far the biggest artist that I've worked with. And it was like so much easier than I would have expected. It was, you know, kind of, <clears throat> weird how easy it was because she kind of let me do my own thing with very minimal direction. Um, yeah, and I worked with the art director, Brian Rodinger on this and Olivia B was the photographer. So it was a interesting process just because there were so many people involved, you know, on the label side of things and just on the creative side of things. It was a really great, project. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this next, 
this is a little bit of a an example of how you know something that started out as an album cover develops over time. This is on the left is a album cover that I did for Chris Forsyth and the Solar Motel Band um, for an album called The Rarity of Experience that I did maybe two years ago. Um, and the whole album art was these kind of diptychs in these frames and which is something I've done in the past a lot. And the Belgian fashion designer Dries van Noten contacted me and wanted me to do some work for his 2019 collection, I think so, or 18 August, what is it? Autumn, autumn, autumn winter, 1819. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that much about fashion, so it's been a learning process. But so you can see this, this artwork that I did for Chris Forsyth, I basically created a whole bunch of other works in the similar style and they ended up on the runway in Paris and then this is an animated version of one of the artworks. It should have sound, but... Oh yeah. So this is this was animated um, by an animator in London and I did the sound design. Um, and so this whole campaign was, you know, developed just from a few images. Um, I did a few pieces and then they were turned into window displays by, for the stores in Paris and Antwerp by Dries Van Noten. Um, yeah, and so one of the most interesting things for me is the way that um, I've, I've been inspired in the past a lot by the way that artwork that, you know, starts out on the fringes of culture, you know, in a kind of underground community works its way to the surface. And, you know, I, I'm really inspired by a lot of like commercial art, for lack of a better word, uh, from the 60s and 70s that was stuff that was kind of co-opting psychedelic art or surrealism and you know things that were you know ads for headache medicine or whatever that's like the craziest psychedelic art you've ever seen <laughs> and so it's been really interesting for me navigating this because i come from you know noise music that's how i got my start and now i'm doing stuff for you know giant fashion designers and I've done stuff for Nike and Apple and all of these giant corporations. And it, it's, you know, when I was a kid, that stuff was often the way that I found out about the artists that I love and, you know, kind of a gateway to the larger world outside. So I've, you know, and I've done from the album cover artwork, I've moved into doing illustration work for publications like the New York Times and the New Yorker and Wired Magazine and several other publications. Um, and th this stuff is, you know, to me, the, the way that my work has developed over the years and the way that I've ended up where I am, not having ever gone to college for what I'm doing, just, just making things because that's what I know how to do, <laughs> um, is, you know, I, I think about when I was a kid and seeing things and, you know, me doing an album cover for Kesha, if I can turn one kid who sees that Kesha album cover and then digs a little deeper and finds out about me and then finds out about some of the more obscure experimental bands that I've done artwork for and, you know, opening up someone's mind just through these threads that they can follow and, you know, like I was saying, the, the doors that they can open up and go off into, you know, another world, basically. That's, that's kind of like, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily my goal, but it's definitely like a perk of being able to work on such a large scale with so much visibility on what you're doing. And, and I feel like I've managed to do it and not 
compromise anything, which I feel like is a really important thing. Like I don't want to water down what I'm doing or, you know, if I do something for Nike, I want it to look like me, <laughs> not like Nike. So yeah, that's a, I guess that's kind of like the, you know, closing idea for me is just this, this idea of like, you know, using, using artwork as a way to kind of expose people to a world that maybe they wouldn't know before. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.